what I wanted to tell you guys about this morning is, is a new book that uh, Andrew Barton, who's a professor at the University of Maine, Farmington, and I uh, recently co-edited it. It's called Ecology, oh thank you, it's called Ecology and Recovery of Eastern Old Growth Forests. So happy to see that Victoria has a copy of it already. It's, it's, it's oh, okay, University. But I got the Vermont Law School copy. That's the U and U and We want you to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this is a co-edited volume. It brings together chapters uh, written by many of the foremost uh, experts on old growth forests in, in Eastern North America, including Canada. Uh, published by Island Press. We were hoping to have Charlie Cogbill in this one, but it didn't quite work out. Um, the next one, Charlie, we'll catch you in here. Um, there was a book published in 1994, I believe, by Mary Bird Davis, was the, the editor of that one, that at that time synthesized sort of the, the early science around eastern old growth forests that was developing at that time. And if you think about this, early 90s, we just come out of this, this period of, of real discovery around old growth in the 1970s and 80s, but much of it was out west, Most, much of it was in the Pacific Northwest, and it was driven by concerns over declining populations of northern spotted owl, and Pacific salmon, and late, later the marbled murrelet, and so there was a huge amount of activity studying old growth forests in that region of the country which then ultimately led to something called the Northwest Forest Plan that conserves most of the remaining old growth, at least in the US portion of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and as those ideas about old growth were developed there, they, they percolated east, and folks around here started looking for old growth as well. And the sort of prevailing dogma until that time had been that, oh, we don't really have old growth in the eastern US, right? We've, we're a highly settled landscape, and most of it was cleared in the 18th and 19th centuries. There's no old growth here, or if there is, there were just a few tiny stands that people knew about. I think the Nature Conservancy might have gotten its start on Long Island, is that correct? Preserving one of the few remaining old growth forests there. I think that was one of the very early chapters of the of the Nature Conservancy. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. We can look it up later. Um, you know, but so we had a few examples like that that folks knew about, but but not much else. Well, anyway, people um, uh, decided to challenge that notion, and they started looking. and And the more they looked, the more they found. And we found large areas of old growth forest in the Adirondack State Park, for example. And now we know that there's something like 400,000 acres, nobody knows for sure, because it's never been mapped, believe it or not, about 400,000 acres of primary and old growth forest there. And I'll just say as a side note, the Adirondacks are really exceptional that way because the old growth there occurs across, across such large areas, large landscapes. So this argument that old, the old growth that we have is somehow anomalous, that these are just really strange little sites that for whatever reason escape logging or clearing is, is not really true of the Adirondacks. There we have entire landscapes that are representative of ecological and geophysical diversity across the landscape. Um, okay, so anyway, that's one place we found some old growth, also in parts of Maine, like the Big Reed Preserve, parts of the White Mountains in New Hampshire. Yeah. I'm sorry to think a lot, but what is old, how old is old? <laughs> I like the way you're keeping me honest with this, with this question. Um, so I, I don't like using age alone. No one does because, you know, uh, forests develop at different rates on different soils, different sites, different disturbance histories. But generally, roughly, in the eastern um, US, we think of about 158 years as a sort of an approximate kind of threshold around which we might see some of these characteristics developing. But we use typically a combination of age, structure, or the architecture of the forest, and also its particular disturbance history, and, and maybe um, how, how humans have affected it as well. So disturbance history, <coughs> age, and structure, we use those three criteria, basically. Um, but it's important, in my view, again, not to be too restrictive around those things, because we don't want to bias ourselves and have this, again, archetypical notion of what we think old growth should look like, 
And then if we go out and we look for that, sure enough, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that's what we're going to find. Charlie has done huge amounts of, of work around pre-settlement forests using, I hope I'm putting words in your mouth, so feel free to jump in at any point, you got it. using witness tree records and, you know, showing that a lot of times old growth, um, you know, might not have, have fit our notion of what we think it should look like. So we don't want to be too restrictive around that. Okay. Um, where was I? <laughs> Old growth that we discovered. White um, mountains. Yeah, White Mountains, <laughs> Southern Appalachians, um, you know, parts of the Alleghenies up through um, Pennsylvania. So, you know, we, f we found old growth, cypress swamps, you know, the few remaining uh, cypress uh, old growth stands down through the Carolinas, then around the coast in Louisiana. Uh, Alabama, places like that. Not to mention long needle pine systems of the southeast, um, uh, slash pine, long, long needle pine, these other systems that form more of a, a pine savanna type of structure, much like ponderosa pine forests do out west. These are fire dependent ecosystems, so they don't look like old growth in the northeast. They look like old growth should in the southeast, in a pine system with an open understory and an open canopy, widely spaced old pine trees. <clears throat> what about systems in the upper Midwest? We, we found tremendous amounts of old growth across northern Wisconsin, upper peninsula of Michigan, boundary waters of northern Minnesota, one of my favorite places on earth, um, and a whole wide range of old, old growth systems there, both northern hardwoods, old growth spruce fir or boreal forests that are fingering down into the northern tier of the US, as well as um, old growth jack pine systems, which is a little bit of a, a misnomer in a way. I don't know if you know much about jack pine, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's considered an early seral species, meaning it's sort of successional to something else, typically northern hardwoods, and it comes in after a big stand replacing fire. But if you have the right conditions and the right um, fire regime, the jack pine can form an old growth structure before maybe seceding to northern hardwoods or something else that comes in later. So yeah, so, so a huge diversity of old growth types, each with different disturbance regimes, different characteristics, and just a huge amount of dynamics that, that are involved here. Okay, so I've taken you to sort of the early 90s now, and we have this understanding that, okay, we do have old growth in the eastern United States. And that first book, again, by Mary Beard Davis and, and, and co-authors, was really just documenting and describing the old growth that, that we had in the in eastern U.S. at that time. Since then, since the 90s, so through the late 90s and, and 2000s, the science has, has moved away from just basic descriptions of these ecosystems to more of an understanding of their internal processing. You know, so what are the processes that these ecosystems carry out, like primary productivity and photosynthesis, and how do those things change as a forest ages? And do these systems become carbon sinks or carbon sources? That's a really important topic these days and, and really the focus of a lot of my research. Um, how do these ecosystems interact with natural disturbances like wind and insects and, and ice storms and fire? <clears throat> um, how do they process and retain nutrients? Are they um, sort of like a, a sieve that nutrients are leaking out of into the streams? Or are they highly efficient at processing and retaining nutrients and limiting the movement of phosphorus and nitrogen and other things in the surface water bodies. Really important here in the Lake Champlain Basin, of course, right? Um, uh, so the biogeochemistry of these ecosystems, how do they work, how do they tick? Um, so that's really where the science uh, has gone. Dynamics, processing, functions, and that's why uh, Andrew Barton and I felt like it was time for a new book. And it's not just a new edition or a revision of the, of the first one. It's really entirely new. So all of these chapters basically describe 
the new science, the new understanding of Olga forest that's developed over the last 20 or 30 years. Again, stressing dynamics and processes. Yeah. yeah. I have a question about that. I remember when Tom Wessels was here, was here, he spoke extensively about all the important mycorrhizal connections under the soil. Mm -hmm. And is that one of the criteria that you are using in <coughs> deciding what the old growth no, are? How not do you measure it? Yeah, it's not a criteria. It would be incredibly difficult yeah. to use. Um, I think what I can say is that there's a huge amount of interest in the below ground community and the mycorrhizae and understanding um, uh, not just the types of symbiotic relationships that those carry out in terms of you know, water acquisition and nutrient acquisition and, and, and the really fascinating way in which veg above ground vegetation literally farms that community of below ground uh, microbes, not just mycorrhizal fungi, but lots of other things as well, by, by exuding photosynthate into the soil to farm that community that the trees depend on. So there's a lot of research on that, but there's also a lot of research just trying to understand the, the biodiversity of those mycorrhizal <coughs> fungi species which turns out to be immense, hundreds, maybe thousands of species of, of mycorrhizal fungi. And fascinatingly, some trees and shrubs are, are very narrow in their, their um, symbiotic relationships. In other words, they only form those with a few mycorrhizal species. Others are ge very general and, and form these symbiotic relationships with, with tens or hundreds of species of mycorrhizal fungi. In some cases, those change as a tree ages and as a forest ages. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating area. We, we, we know very little about it. It's one of these sort of new frontiers of ecology, like mm -hmm. deep ocean vents or thermal <laughs> hot springs in Yellowstone or something like that. You know, it's a fascinating area of ecology. I hope I've you know, answered to some extent. But no, it would be really difficult to use that as yeah, an indicator of old growth. Old growth. Okay, so that's what we attempted to do in, in the book. Um, maybe I'll just look at my, my slides to just prompt me a little here. Um, so um, I started off with a, a quote and sort of along these lines, or, or not a quote. I said quote because I'm used to quoting other people, but in this case, I actually wrote it. <laughs> it's my book, it's my first book. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the, in the introduction, uh, I wrote, old growth, the ter term evokes something deep in the human psyche. We imagine the forest primeval, something timeless from our distant collective memory. It's almost like we have this nostalgia for a time past, you know, that we, that we yearn for a, a time before our landscapes maybe were so profoundly changed by, by all the things we've seen around us. And, you know, this is a very romanticized view of old growth, and by no means do we try to dispel that in this book. We, we just argue that we need sort of a new romantic sense of old growth, maybe, because, you know, whereas the old view, this view of the, the forest primeval, something distant from our collective memory, you know, is grounded in, in ideas of, you know, the, the squirrel that could move from tree to tree, from Georgia to, to Maine, and, and it just kind of disregards the fact that there were tens of thousands of indigenous people living on those landscapes for, for thousands of years and profoundly influencing them. It disregards what we now know about natural disturbances and how those shaped it and sculpted these landscapes. And they were, they were messy and they were complex and they weren't just a continuous cover of cathedral-like trees or groves of trees. You know, so we need to change our conception of old growth landscapes, and, and we need to stress things like complexity and dynamics. I think that there's also, for you know, 150 years of natural science, been this, this, um, this yearning for what we often call the balance of nature. You've probably heard that a million times in nature documentaries, right? You know, like the the lion and the gazelle, and they're maintaining the balance of nature on the African savanna, you know? And I think that the, the contemporary ecologist might reject the idea that there's balance in nature. I don't think there is balance in nature. I see no signs of it. I, I think that nature strives for um, change. It's continuously changing over time and space. It's dynamic, and in fact, 
What we now know is that biodiversity requires change because change in dynamics, those represent niches and complexity and resource availability and shifting competitive playing fields among species. So rather than seeking for, for balance and, and those kinds of ideas, we need to seek for, for change and complexity and those sorts of things. So you know, if we start talking about restoring or, or, or bringing back sort of the future adapted old growth system, we, we need to recognize that that's not going to be some kind of static condition that we're going to create in the landscape. It's going to be something that's ever changing, ever shifting over time and space. Okay, so I'm, I'm really philosophizing here. Maybe it's because we're in church and I'm, I'm <laughs> feeling it. Yeah. So that's just making me think when, when you say that the balance of nature and change, I don't see that as static and staying still. I see that as always fluctuating mm -hmm. and adapting and making changes for, you know, right. what have you, if there's a big burst of something going on. Okay. Um, well, that's good. I, I mean, I think if, if we think of it that way, then I would agree with, uh -huh. with it okay. and with you. So, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. You know, so, but I guess the point is that rather than it being a single static condition, it's really, a, it's a range of conditions, and right. ecologists would call that the range of natural variability that ecosystems are constantly fluctuating within. Um, certainly, old growth systems do. Like our bodies so, sort of do that, you yeah. know, constantly mm -hmm. adapting to changes, and yeah. Yeah. influences from the outside, and yeah. change, or whatever. We could have a really interesting philosophical discussion of where that idea came from, like stability and balance. And I mean, in a history of science class, you might even trace that back to some of the early sort of theological pushback on Darwinian biology and the theory of natural selection. You know, sort of like, well, we'll give you natural selection and punctuated equilibrium as long as we can still have balance, <laughs> you know, because it sort of implies a sort of a divine influence there. And anyway, there's a really interesting kind of uh, history there behind some of these ideas. Anyway, I don't know if you would agree, but anyway. Well, I don't know if this is the right time to ask this question and make complicated things, but yeah. I'm kind of wondering how you parse this definition of this primeval, transcendental forests, yeah. uh, the disturbance regimes, the succession regimes, and then you know all the human influence with modern day human aspirations for old growth forests. Everyone looks at them differently, and I know yeah. you mentioned biodiversity, and I don't know necessarily that maximizing biodiversity would be an objective, for example. Um, you could disturb a, a longleaf pine savanna and increase its biodiversity. So, you know, I'm kind of wondering how does, how do our, no, our sort of contemporary notions of sort of how we fit in these forests and what we might yeah. want to see in them. And biodiversity right. is often emphasized, right. like how much that figures into your thinking on this. It figures in quite a bit. Um, and I would agree with you that you know when we talk about managing for biodiversity, what we're talking about is, is managing for a huge range of biodiversity right. associated with different kinds of habitat conditions and different successional stages. So not just old growth, not just early successional habitats. The key is that we need a mix of all of those. And we, we should be thinking about the proportions of those things that we want on the landscape. Mm -hmm. Conservation biologists refer to these as alpha, beta, and gamma biodiversity. Alpha diversity is the diversity you have within a single habitat type. Beta diversity is what you have among multiple habitat types. And gamma diversity is what, what occurs across a gradient or across a landscape. And we need all of those things. And, and this, this bothers me a little bit because I feel like, at least in the forestry profession, we get really hung up around some of these questions. And these days, everybody's arguing for early successional habitat, early successional, right. early successional, patch cutting, patch cutting. Yeah. And they're saying, that's what we need for wildlife. That's what we need for biodiversity. But no, that's not correct. That's only one type of biodiversity, right. one yeah. group of biodiversity. And really, we need to be thinking about the whole mix on the landscape. This is in my slideshow. These are the ver vertebrate habitat associations of the northeastern US. And it's this classic U-curve that we see all over the world. So lots of species that need young forest structures, lots that need old forest structures, 
and then uh, only a few that are in the middle. Um, most of our force right now are in the middle. So what we need to think about doing then, which might have higher invertebrate diversity. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. No, I don't think so. Um, so, you know, some folks are arguing for early successional habitat. I'm saying that's fine, but let's also promote some of this late successional old growth habitat too. And those things are not mutually exclusive. We can have some of both. So that's really the key, I think. And, you know, 10%, I've heard that number floated. I think, Kate, you mentioned that in, in your introduction. You know, and that's fine as a, as a starting point, and I'm happy that the state is, is even proposing that idea. But, you know, um, that's far less than what we would have had historically. Um, I don't know, maybe we can try it like this a little bit. <laughs> so, um, so this is something called an age class distribution. And this is kind of what we think the distribution of forest types would have looked like pre-European settlement. So it's a, a positive exponential curve, right? So lots of old growth, somewhere between, I don't know, 80 to 90% of the landscape uh, in that condition, maybe around 10% in young forest, mostly from beaver activity, some Native American burning, particularly through the mid-Atlantic states in the south, um, maybe parts of Vermont and lowland areas. Um, and, a, and a little bit in the middle. By the 19th century, of course, we completely shifted that distribution. So we had a landscape dominated by open, grassy, and shrubby conditions. You know, late 19th century, abandoned agricultural lands. And, and that's why, um, you know, 150 late years later, we have this bubble of essentially mature or sort of middle-aged forests that regenerated on that abandoned agricultural landscape. And so really what we're talking about with this debate, and I think fundamental to your question, is what we do with this bubble. Mm -hmm. And there are those that are saying, well, we should shift more of it back to the early, early successional because we miss seeing those, those bird species that we were familiar with and that we loved seeing. And I, I, I get that. Um, my mom is an avid birder, and she misses seeing those and, and wants them back. I understand that. But we can also shift more of this to that late successional old growth condition as well. 10% is a starting point, but my point is that it's still far below what would have been here historically. But, you know, maybe it's practical given the modern landscape. Okay, so um, not sure where I am here in my talk, but I'll just try to get back on target here a little bit. Um, so, um, you know, again, I've spent a lot of my, my career, uh, last 20 years, studying old growth forests in lots of places, um, the Northeast, um, but also many other places. And um, what I've looked for then in this, in, in this research is some similarities that these systems have and, and reasons why it might be important to, uh, to conserve and manage for them. And, and one of the most important things that we found is that even with the high degree of variability among systems, and there are different uh, sort of pathways al along which old growth forests can, can develop. Um, generally, as a general statement, oops, um, a commonality that almost all these systems form or have is very, very high levels of carbon storage. So this, this is a figure showing uh, forests in the Northeast. These are my data from the Adirondacks, and I've got biomass or carbon on this axis, and I have forest age on this axis. And even though there's a lot of variability and, and sort of different pathways here, there's this general trend of increasing carbon storage and biomass very late into forest development in, in our forests here. And the important point in this figure is that that continued positive accumulation of carbon storage and biomass seems to continue much later into forest development than we previously thought. Earlier models that came out of Hubbard Brook and elsewhere uh, predicted and showed a, a peak in biomass fairly early on at around age 170, and then sort of a leveling off of that later, and maybe even declines. And we still see that in some places. There's research in the upper Midwest that seems to suggest that, well, maybe that's the, the trend that their forests follow. Um, I think that the most recent science has shown that 
there actually is a lot of variability in how this can play out over time, but still, in general, um, I think we've learned that older forests store very, very high levels of carbon, more so than we previously thought. And that's not just true of the Northeast, that's true of the Pacific Northwest, the same trend there. It's true in um, Tierra del Fuego and Patagonia, and it's true in the Carpathians of Eastern Europe. Um, so it seems to hold up sort of universally at, at the global scale. So that, that gives us then a whole new reason to think about promoting old forest structure, right? And even if the forests of the future will be different from the forests of the past, we still might be able to promote that function. So forest structures or architectures that store very high levels of carbon and provide habitat for the, the biodiversity that needs complexity like that. Okay, so that's maybe one reason to really think about old growth restoration, carbon storage, climate change mitigation. And now with rapidly developing carbon markets, both domestically, mostly through the California compliance market, and then also internationally through uh, international voluntary carbon markets, now there's actually an economic incentive for landowners to do this because uh, the, the, the forestry practices that promote that kind of complexity and carbon storage are exactly the kinds of practices that the carbon markets incentivize. So there's now sort of a new financial incentive for some folks to, to think about this. Okay, um, something else that, that, that I've learned, and we have a chapter about, about this in here, is um, the exceptionally high quality of stream habitats that run through old growth forests. I wish I could show you these pictures blown up on this stream. I don't know if you can see this beautiful Adirondack stream and all the woody debris piles in it, massive, massive accumulations of downed logs and debris dams. These don't look like most of our streams that we see around here, but old growth streams um, have this incredible complexity largely related to the input of large logs, but also related to other things like, um, I don't know, rooting strength and, and um, geomorphic complexity in the stream channel and other sorts of characteristics. <clears throat> um, we've learned a lot in our, our research uh, about how that complexity in these old growth streams influences things like um, primary productivity in the stream. And, and how where you have a complex forest canopy over the stream, um, uh, you, you, you typically can bring in more light in gaps and sunflex into the stream environment, which gives it a little bit more um, productivity or, or autotrophic production by algae and aquatic plants compared to um, a younger forest stream that has a strictly closed canopy overhead and very, very little light reaching the stream. So these old growth streams, to, I'll try to maybe describe that a little bit more clearly. These old growth streams have a huge complexity of light environments. They have cool shaded patches that are really important for brook trout and macroinvertebrates. Um, and they also have some sunlit patches where you have a little bit higher primary productivity. And, and the combination of those enhances the overall com complexity and productivity of these stream systems. So this is um, really brand new research, just sort of hot off the presses. But it's another reason then to think about managing or promoting old growth forests on a part of the landscape for these stream functions. So you know that's not something that most people typically think about. Okay, so um, we've, we've outlined maybe a couple reasons then to think about conserving or managing for old growth. We've said biodiversity, making sure we take care of the habitat needs of those groups of species. We've said carbon storage and climate change mitigation. We've, set, we've, we've said stream functioning or high quality stream habitats. So then the question is, how do we do this, right? How do we actually restore old growth forests? And um, well, right off the bat, there's two fundamental options, right? Like one is uh, we just do nothing and we allow these forests to develop on their own. And there certainly will be 
large portions of the landscape where that happens. Um, in Vermont, um, that might be some major conservancy preserves, but it also is going to be, uh, you know, mostly on the congressionally designated wilderness areas on the Green Mountain National Forest, for example. There's 100,000 acres of of designated wilderness there where these conditions will, will develop over time. But there are lots of other places where we might think about using silviculture to actively promote the development of these characteristics and functions. And, and um, that's where my research comes into play. And, I, and so I, I just want to be careful about this because I'm not saying that we should do this everywhere. I'm saying that there's a role for that in some places. Uh, on land trust lands in uh, conserved, uh, you know, conserved areas, um, even on working forests where we have landowners that are interested in providing a mix of habitats, a variety of conditions on their property, and also maybe where they're interested in participating in carbon markets and, and gaining that, that financial incentive through the sale of emissions offsets. Okay, so there's going to be a role for this kind of silviculture. And, um, and, and that's why I've spent the last 20 years studying a system that, that might work uh, for that objective. But I also want to be really careful, though, that I'm not, you know, to say that I'm not the only person that's been working on this. There's been lots of great work, University of Maine, University of Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And we've seen um, a number of different silvicultural systems tested that promote the development of old growth structure over time. The one I'm about to refer to is just one example. It's the most local. But in the book, we have two chapters on old growth silviculture. I wrote one, and um, Tony D'Amato and, and a group of other people wrote the other. So we, we discuss a, a, a number of different options that landowners might consider. OK, my system, can you guys see this when I use my slides? It's, it's better than nothing, I guess. OK, so my study is up on the, the west side of Mount Mansfield. Uh, it's called the Vermont Forest Ecosystem Management Demonstration Project. And uh, there's the, the forehead, and this is the Butler Lodge Trail that comes up here through the middle of it. And I have these experimental units back in the woods on both sides of the trail that most people are unaware of. Um, and, and then this whole study is replicated at the Jericho Research Forest and, and also at a, another location in the Adirondacks. Um, so um, uh, in this study, basically, started with what I, what I learned about old growth forests, right? So like, what are their characteristics? What is their structure? How do they function? So we used the remaining old growth forests as, as a reference. And then from that, um, I developed a silvicultural technique called structural complexity enhancement. Um, so notice that I'm not calling it old growth restoration because I wouldn't presume to be sort of re-engineering an old growth forest exactly. Instead, what I'm saying is we can use really good forestry techniques to kind of reintroduce more complexity into a managed forest, a working forest, than, let's say, more conventional silvicultural approaches might achieve. OK, so we developed this approach called structural complexity enhancement. Um, I, I implemented this on the study um, 16 years ago, I think, the winter of, 23, of, 20, of 2003. And so we've been monitoring how the site has developed uh, for, um, for 16 years now. And excitingly, it seems to be working quite well. These are pictures of my um, structural complexity enhancement units uh, 14 years after they were treated. And they, they've developed tremendous vertical complexity, um, what, what I would refer to as a vertically contiguous canopy, the foliage from the forest floor to the top of the canopy. They're gappy. They have lo lots of large down logs and tip-up mounds. Um, they have more big trees than would be typically found in a forest like this. Um, so they just have a tremendous amount of structural complexity. Um, so it seems to have worked that way. We've also put a lot of work into monitoring the biodiversity responses. And I could show you lots of data for these, but I, I just brought one slide because I, I thought, thought it might be interesting. 
This is, um, these are data from a recent paper on the fungal responses, the fungi. You asked me about mycorrhizae before. And this white bar here is basically what we found in the structural complexity enhancement units, the old growth treatment. And the other bars are what we find in the more conventionally harvested um, comparisons. So areas that were single tree selection or group selection, and then also the controls. I'll just finish the thought and then I'll go ahead and take the question. So what we've seen is that we were very successful with this approach after just 15 years for this paper in really substantially enhancing the richness of the fungal community. And then when we dig in further, we find that that's true of not just the decomposers, and the synophytic <clears throat> fungi that you might guess would show that response, but also the mycorrhizal community, and um, edible, harvestable mushrooms as well. So that should make the mushroom pickers really happy. So that, that was really just an exciting result. Yes? You may get be getting to this, but you used the word treatment. And I'm curious if you'd say a few words about that or, or will about what, what, what we did. did? What is the intervention you're doing? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Well, what am I going to do when I go home? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, great. Um, so, structural complexity enhancement. How does this work? Um, basically, what we're trying to do is mimic the way Mother Nature does it herself. And she does it through natural disturbances that open up gaps in the canopy or free up growing space for the larger trees to add foliage and photosynthetic area, or by freeing up growing space for trees in the, the sub canopies to then uh, be released and, and work their way towards the, the top of the canopy. So we're trying to mimic the natural disturbance processes that would enable or facilitate the development of an old growth structure over time. Okay, so what that means for us then is creating small gaps but not just like cookie cutter gaps, variably sized gaps that are highly irregular and ragged. If you spent time with me in the old growth of the Adirondacks, you would see that the disturbances there are incredibly irregular. You, you know, it's not this classic gap model of a little cookie cutter slice taken out of the forest. Basically, the canopy overhead is just continuously variable. So we have gaps with um, residual trees that have survived, um, sometimes live, sometimes dead, sometimes snapped, sometimes uprooted, um, all different densities and configurations. So very, very irregular, variable canopy <coughs> conditions. So that's what we're trying to create soliculturally. I also did things like um, a technique called crown release where I basically thin around the crowns of some of the larger, most dominant trees. And what you're trying to do in that case is to produce larger trees faster. And this gets a little tricky, because if we're talking about a 100-year-old tree or an 80-year-old 80 80 year tree, you're not going to be able to increase its growth rates. Its growth rates are already slowing down at that point. But what we're trying to do with crown release is we're trying to arrest the rate of decline in it <coughs> arrest that so that the tree reaches a larger size faster than it otherwise would. And we think, based on previous research, and, and it seems to be working, is that we can basically have the time it will take for it to reach a, a very large size or sort of an old growth size. And what kind of forest communities are these? Northern hardwoods. All northern hardwoods. My, my sites, well, are, are your typical sugar maple, beech, yellow birch, or at the Jericho Research Forest, it's a mixed woods, so hemlock hardwoods. And how big are those plots? Each treatment unit, a treatment in this case means an experimental treatment or manipulation. Each of those is assigned to a five acre block. Okay. And then it's a replicated design, statistically robust, so we have lots of replicates of each of the treatments. We did other things just to finish the answer. It's a long answer. Um, girdled trees to create big snags. I felled trees and left them on the ground to create downward debris. We even used um, machinery to either push trees over or to pull them over to create big tip-up mounds. And that's been one of the most exciting things for me. Cool. I'm a huge tip-up mound fan. <laughs> and it worked 
beyond my wildest expectations in terms of you know winter wrens nesting in these tip-up mounds, evidence of black bear denning under them, incredible regeneration of yellow birch on top of these tip-ups, just like we see in old growth forests. Um, other things like elderberry and, and, and other other shrubs coming in on top of the tip-up mounds because that's where the birds are defecating the seeds. Just like in an old growth forest, it's fascinating to see this. So we did lots of things, but um, structural complexity enhancement is basically a package of all of those different silvicultural treatments. And this is a really important point, because when I present this to foresters or to landowners, I never say, you have to do all these things. No, it's that this is more of a menu that you can choose from. You can pick and choose these different techniques depending on how they uh, they meet your objectives for your land and your property. So if you're more interested in harvesting timber, you, you can tweak this. If you're more interested in like flat out old growth restoration, you can tweak it that way. It's very flexible. Uh, so there are a couple of hands, I think. You had yours? Yeah. All right, two questions. Like, what kind of equipment are you using? So this treatment, it, it could be done a number of different ways. There's, doesn't have to be one particular way. In, in my experiment, we did the harvesting um, two different ways. On Mount Mansfield, it was mostly mechanized with a machine called a tree shear, which is a big mechanized uh, machine, drives around on tracks and has a big arm that reaches out and grabs a tree and cuts it and then can delimit and can cut it to length and, and then you pull the log out. And with some hand felling of crews running around the woods where the machine yes, couldn't get. Um, do you, you need know, that? Good, it's all about the logger getting a good contractor yeah. who knows how to do this well, and you would be amazed where they can go. But it's a really important question to, yeah. to not do more damage, more harm than good. So we, we had a good um, sort of mainline access road in that case, and then skid trails that went off from there. Um, the other location, the Jericho Forest, uh, less of a road network. And uh, I wanted, for other reasons like steep terrain, I wanted to be really, really careful. So I used smaller machinery, like small skidders, mostly um, um, cable skidders, as opposed to a big grapple skidder that's used for whole tree harvesting and that kind of thing. And mostly hand felling, just old fashioned chainsaw yeah. felling, which is harder to do, do these days. It's harder to find contractors that. that can make that work financially. Yeah, because you have to pay all these people. There are all these problems. And forestry is on a tight margin these days, yeah. and it's hard for these contractors mm -hmm. to, to make a living. Um, so anyway, I, yeah. I just had another question about that. Um, what, you've been the, you're bidding crowns of large trees to to arrest the decline of the yeah. trees? Yeah, well, I wish you had a chalkboard. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, a tree's growth rate yeah. begins to slow down once it hits around right. 80, 90, 100 years of age. So its growth rates are declining at that point. And, and I didn't think that I could turn that around and, 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 and cause that tree to increase its growth rates. Instead, what I'm trying to do is just arrest the decline so that its growth rate declines a little bit more slowly. And if I was graphing this out, what that means is that it, it, this is tree size. The tree size reaches a higher point faster than it otherwise would have. Okay, so the tree is the rate of growth is slowing down, but the tree is getting larger sooner. Exactly. It gets larger sooner because it's not declining as fast as it otherwise would have. But there's some interesting, you know, scientific evidence around this question actually emerging from another a number of places around the world suggesting that in some cases big old trees that reach the top of the canopy are actually able to s increase their growth rates and you're seeing their, their pho photosynthetic capacity shoot up and their, their productivity suddenly ticks upwards it runs absolutely counter to dogma to what we thought in forest ecology for 50 years mm -hmm. but it seems to suggest that yeah, big trees, if they gain access to that light, they're, they're the winners, you know, they're the genetically superior individuals that have made it to that point in the canopy. Sometimes they can show this growth response. Yeah, I'll go here and then, yeah. Um, so, the climate change and the weather being more extreme, 
the wind being intense and fire. <coughs> in a sense, the forest responds by in increasing its productivity and more frequently. So climate change is horrible, of course, but at the same time, Mother Nature puts out effort, right, to try to regenerate at a quicker pace. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Maybe. It's a tricky question. Uh -huh. I see what you're driving at there. Uh -huh. So certainly if we see more disturbances, more frequent disturbances. I mean, disturbances, it seems like you're trying to mimic disturbance in right. the forest to encourage... Right. That was in the details on this one. Um, so, you know, in my case, I'm trying to mimic finely scaled natural disturbances. Mm -hmm. I think the concern with climate change is that we'll see more chronic... Right. Um, I'm not saying it's a good thing. But just like, you know, some of these yeah. storms that come through, right. it seems like more It's all about down. the intensity and the frequency of those yeah. things. And if we keep knocking the system back over and over and over again, sure, you're going to have release, you're going to have regeneration. So yeah. the system is resilient in yeah. that respect. Yeah. But it might be harder for this old growth structure to develop over time. That said, um, one of the things we've learned about in forest ecology in the last 10 or 20 years is the really important role of what we're now calling intermediate intensity disturbances. So things like microbursts and tornadoes mm -hmm. and straight line winds and mm -hmm. things like this that remove maybe 30 to 50 percent of the canopy. Mm -hmm. So they're not sort of classic canopy gaps. You've all probably seen microburst areas. You know what they look like. They're very irregular. And they tend to create a very interesting sort of multi-aged forest structure. They leave behind some big trees. Um, they leave some mid-canopy trees. They release whatever advanced regeneration is in the understory. And you know, so that creates a different kind of complexity on the landscape. And, and it might be that that's completely natural, you know, that we might have just been sort of disregarding that kind of disturbance event. And it's probably been here all along. And I think one of the really interesting questions now is whether that kind of disturbance is increasing on the landscape, or, or whether we're just paying more attention to it now. I think the evidence is beginning to support that it's the former, that, we're, that with climate change and, and sort of atmospheric instability, we really are seeing more of this kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, that was an interesting discussion. I don't know if I answered your question fully. Uh, yeah. Um, a couple of things. First of all, I, I have 100 acres out in Plainfield, but we just got a USDA and RCS grant for what they call pre-commercial thinning, uh -huh. which really amounts to taking the skinny, tall trees out of the way so the big trees can grow better. Right. And um, you know, so so there seems to be, accidentally or on purpose, some support, you know, to help people do that sort of thing. And I, I had a chance a month or two ago to talk to Peter Welke in the state forestry department or something. I'm not quite sure what his title is. Um, but to say that the state ought to help people understand how to put more carbon in, even if, you know, I'm not big enough to be in the carbon market, but I'd like to do it right. And, you know, the kind of thing you're teaching us is, is part of doing it right. Yeah, pre-commercial thinning is a, is a very valuable approach here. You know, and that was part of this study as well. And there are different terms for that. Some people call it thinning from below the canopy or timber stand improvement. But mm -hmm. that idea of, of you're basically increasing the rate at which that forest would naturally thin itself. Self thinning is the other term that we use for it. Um, and that can push you along towards that late successional old growth condition more rapidly. So actually, that was part of my study as well. Mm -hmm. And with cost share like that, you know, that's the way to make it work economically via, you know, to make it work economically, because otherwise, typically can't pay for it. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the wholesale elimination of the species like the ash do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, ash is important. Uh, it's important. It's sort of minor component of a lot of these forests, uh, it, more of a significant component on richer sites and in coves and other kinds of landforms. Certainly, if we're talking about green ash, and Riparian forest, the loss of ash would be would be huge there, um, but in a lot of our upland kind of northern hardwoods, especially on you know less productive sites, it's not not going to be as important of a loss. Still important, but it's just not as major of a component of the forest. So I'm concerned about ash, believe me. But um, I'm, I'm even more concerned about hemlock woolly adelgid and and the sort of the really the 
100% mortality rates that they're seeing in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and some of the old hemlock stands down there. You know, just really, really bad damage. I'm also really concerned about the loss of large American beach, and we never talk about this. You know, the decimation of our forests from beach bark disease. It is just incredibly sad. And large beach have basically dropped out of the canopy of the old growth sites I'm working in in the Adirondacks, whereas 30 or 40 years ago, they were a really important component of those systems. And then, of course, what replaces them is this thicket of beech sprouts in the understory. Mm -hmm. And I'm really concerned about that, what you know, uh, the future of those forests will look like. You know, and as the remaining, the other species in the canopy begin to die, so the hemlock, the sugar maple, the red maple, the yellow birch, they're still there. And they're clearly not able to regenerate now underneath this sub canopy of really, really dense beach. And then for other reasons too, like deer browse and mm -hmm. acid deposition and all the other calcium depletion, all the other usual suspects. But the beach, I think, are playing a really important role. Mm -hmm. I'm worried that the whole system is going to basically collapse into a beach thicket over time mm -hmm. you know, because nothing is coming up under the, this beach. Um, so I'm really worried about the future of these forests. And we have to do something, I think, to deal with this problem. I'd love to see more attention paid to the beach bark disease issue. There's some, but not enough. Uh, yeah. Can you speak about the clay plain forest restoration efforts? Well, I could try. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually not the, the expert on that. Um, Who's the fellow at Middlebury Mark College? Lappin. Mark Lappin is, the, is the, the person to go to for that. And TNC's done a lot of great work also, I think, in the Cleveland Forest, North Paul and others. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't, I'm not as expert about them. I, I, I do know that um, it's, a, it's a fascinating community just because it's so diverse and has that, that mix of northern hardwoods and, and central hardwoods and, and then some of the kind of real wet site species as well. You know, scarlet oak and, and these others, and so I think that you know it's 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 a fascinating challenge in terms of bringing back that diversity of species, um, and the clay plain also it's 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 so fascinating because where you have that hard pan of clay, you have the potential for really impressive uprooting, and you know, I'm again I'm a Tampa <laughs> fan, and you know Williams Woods and elsewhere you just see these colossally huge tip-up mounds because of that hard hand, which creates these spreading root systems, which then just lift up beautifully after a wind disturbance. You know, so some people say, well, this is, this is a disaster, this, this mess created by, by wind, and, and, but to me, to my eyes, this is beauty, this is complexity, this is exactly what we want. Yeah, so if I was doing restoration there, I would try to mimic some of those processes. Yeah. I'm just wondering if um, there's been any research done on primary forest or the old growth forest um, and some of the insect flights we do have. Does it seem like that the effects of the insects are minimized in an older, more diverse forest? I'm not sure I'm prepared to say that yet. Are you referring to native insects or invasive? No, the invasive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I could say that. I, I, and I'm not sure that we've seen any evidence of that. I know that you know, there, there's been a theory for a long, long time that a more diverse ecosystem mm -hmm. should be more resilient to those mm -hmm. kinds of invasions. You know, it's the Irish potato famine analogy okay. that if it's a monocrop of anything, it's going to be more susceptible. And that's probably true in many ways. Yeah. But, you know, with the pests that we've seen, with emerald ash borer, hemlock lily delgid, yeah. beech bark disease, um, the, the mortality rates are so high, even in these old forests, that there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence. <laughs> But um, there's some really interesting new work coming out around EAB, emerald ash borer, mm -hmm. and, and, and um, some new thinking about how we might be able to actually um, manage the forest in such a way that would help us to identify whatever individual trees out there might have some degree of, of genetic resistance. Mm -hmm. And then if we collected samples from those, we could then breed a resistant variety of ash 
So for the first time in several years, I have a glimmer of hope that we might be able to actually <laughs> restore that species. Don't yeah. cut them all. Yeah. No. This preemptive salvage idea is not a great one. I understand why landowners would want to do that. It makes sense. But um, we need to leave some out there in order to, to determine if there is any resistance. Um, you know, OK, so but let me just approach your question slightly differently. So one thing I haven't mentioned yet is a, another new theory developing called complex adaptive systems, OK? And uh, a lot of folks, especially in Quebec, are working on this. Christian Messier at the University of Quebec, Montreal. Uh, Europeans have been working on this for a long time. Complex adapt adaptive systems. It's the idea that systems that are more diverse, more complex structurally and functionally, might actually be more adaptive to global change. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because, you know, it's sort of like, um, uh, you know, the, uh, Aldo Leopold, you know, the first rule of intelligent tinkering is to keep all the, the parts, right? All, you, you keep all the parts there, and you give the system the capacity to change and to adapt even if you can't anticipate or predict exactly how that's going to happen. But the more complex it is, the more diverse, the more likely it is to adapt. So that's one aspect of this. The other is an idea called functional traits. And, and I understand this is a group of gardeners and horticulturalists. Is that right? You have interest in this area? So you're probably familiar with this idea of functional traits that plants have and the different groups of Plants have different functional traits, different life history strategies, uh, you know, different morphologies and structures. And so it's this idea that if we manage for ecosystems that have a high diversity of traits, the more traits, functional traits, we pack into that system, again, the more potential it has to change and adapt and, and evolve in response to global change. And, and the, the work in, in Montreal there, um, a study just outside the city has experimentally treated a large area with 52 different combinations of, of plant communities, each of which has a different mix of functional traits. And then we're going to look at how well each of those adapts to future change. So from that standpoint, complex adaptive systems, functional trait diversity, I think you can also make an argument for old growth systems, that they tend to have those characteristics. So the more of this we can have on the landscape, the more adaptive the, the landscape will be overall. At least that's our working hypothesis, right? We'll see over the next 100 years what happens. What, what do you mean by a functional trait? <coughs> yeah, so a functional trait might be something like um, a species that uh, is able to put on a lot of fine roots to very competitively acquire nutrients below ground. That might be a functional trait or something that produces resins or pitch to fight off insect infestation. That's a functional trait. Or different shapes and morphologies, I don't know if you know that term, basically shapes of crowns you know, that allow trees and other plants to compete for light at different levels in the canopy. Each of those is a functional trait. Um, it's reproductive strategy. Does it reproduce early and then die, or does it wait until it finally reaches the canopy? You know, that's a functional trait as well. So there are hundreds of these. Yeah. Um, are we ready to wrap it up? Okay. I can keep going. Yeah, okay. That was great.